Friends, welcome back to the Wild at Heart podcast here in the week of November 8th. And we want to begin with a thank you. Thanks, everybody, for the outpouring of support in response to last week's podcast. If you didn't tune in last week, Alan and I were sharing some stories that our staff was, oh my goodness, this staff time we were together and we were, we were one after another after another telling these beautiful stories of the life of the ministry, the impact of, right. of this work. And then we do ask a couple times a year if, if folks would help us because we are a, a nonprofit crowdfunded mission. And so I just want to thank everybody for for the support and the love. And if you haven't had a chance to hear that podcast last week, I mean those stories. Oh, incredible and and moving. And it was great for us as a team to hear each other's stories. Some of them we hadn't heard from others on the team right. yet. And so, yeah, thank you for the generosity for those who have given. And and if God's moving your heart to do so between now and the end of the year. Just know it's much appreciated. We never take it for granted, but it's so helpful. And you're investing in redemption. Like yes. listen to those stories and go, oh yeah, I want to be a part of that. Yes. So thanks everybody. We love you. Really kind. We're going to pick up with a conversation this week that you brought up the other day, Alan, when I was standing in your office about why does life feel like whack-a-mole? <laughs> <laughs> right. Does everybody know that game? The little gopher like yeah. pokes his head up and you have to hit it really quick. Yeah, there's like eight gophers and you don't know which one's going to pop up next. And you've got a hammer with a rubber, kind of a mallet. Whack-a-mole is a fun game to play. It's not a fun way to live life. It's not a fun life when you feel like as soon as one problem you've tackled or you've addressed or you've made right, and then whoop, the next whack-a-mole comes up and you turn your attention and you're on that and the next one and... And it can become exhausting over time if you start to believe or you start to feel like, man, there's always the next thing. Because while you're trying to address one thing in the back of your mind, it's it's almost like you start your eye starts to twitch because you're like, <laughs> where's the next mole coming up? <laughs> yep. So why did you suggest that, Alan? Anything <laughs> anything going on in your life? That- yeah, we ought it, to know. Well, every day is okay. If I can only get these three things done or five things done today, then I'm going to be at the top of the hill. I can sit down, relax, breathe, and inevitably, John, you know, you get to the end of that day, and you know, if it's a good day and things go well, you get those things done. But then the phone call comes in, you know, at <laughs> nine o'clock that night, or yep. uh, you know, a kid who's left the home calls and text and says, you know, hey, I've got this issue, or you get the bill in the mail, the unexpected bill, or there's something where you just go, I did my best and I gave it all and I got nothing in the tank and now this. The and ne- The next mole pops right, its head up. Right. Like your driveway project oh last Oh my summer. gosh. That, <laughs> <laughs> I had a driveway, some of you've heard this, but I, the short story is I had a driveway project because our, we live in a home that's only about 15 years old, and the driveway should last, most driveways, about 30 years plus. And this one started deteriorating like rapidly, and it felt like we our driveway had more potholes and more. It was caving in, and we had no idea why. And everything we tried didn't work, and we tried the short-term solutions. Nothing worked. And even the, so we finally hire somebody and he gives us a quote and then he comes back and tells us it's actually way worse. And I'm like, man, I'm sorry. And he's like, yeah, you're going to be sorry because you're going to be paying double what you thought because none of us saw what was under the concrete and what caused the problem. And so, John, I haven't even told you this, but so we spend all this money, the driveway's fixed. And then a few weeks later, and we did our sidewalk too. I'm out walking our dog around the block, and I'm on our sidewalk, and I look down, and cracks are already no, showing no. a month later. I call the concrete company, and they're like, yeah, we'll get to it, but we're we're booked until next May, and I'm calling them in October, and I'm like, right, I just spent a small fortune, and they're like, yep, we're going to get to it. So it's that, like I told yes. Kelly, even though I trust them, 
Now I've got to keep track of that for six months and hope that it happens like yeah. it should. And that's how life feels sometimes. And I was talking to some team members before you and I spoke this week about it's just always one more thing. And every single one was like, oh, I know. And they gave me two, three stories of what they're going through. So it just felt like a very relevant topic that I'm guessing most listeners mm. can identify with. Mm. The famous quote uh, about history, history is just one damn thing after another. <laughs> <laughs> and it can feel like that, you know, certainly personal history. And we got to be real careful with our hearts because- we are still in the effects of global trauma. And I was reading a fascinating research article the other day about the folks who lived through multiple things like 9-11 and then Hurricane Sandy and then the Boston Marathon bombings. And the research that was done on that is one round of trauma sensitizes you to the next round. Like, you know, the phrase being triggered, you become more touchy. You become more reactive mm -hmm. to it, more sensitive to it. And of course, because your soul hasn't yet fully recovered. And then the next thing hits and, and the next thing. And if you spent any amount of time on the news that can do that to you. If you have a heart for the world, if you right. care about people, you care about the planet, I mean, it's just oof and oof and then another. Yes. So what I wanted to name as we enter the conversation is we are all highly sensitized now to feeling like it's whack-a-mole. Like it's just, oh no, there's another one and there's another one. And that can be very triggering right. and get you into a cycle and into kind of a frame of mind that's not helpful, you know, totally. especially if you're just expecting life to be one damn thing after another. If you're already deep into those agreements, right? then it's going to play oh, out. It is. And Kelly, my wife was telling me, she was saying, talking about herself, I'm really good, I think, when I have a heads up, kind of something's happening and I can help out and step in and, and bring a strength. But so many things lately have been the body blows and the unexpected phone call where it's out of the blue, yes. where things are great and then it's trauma, tragedy, yes, uh, you know, hard news. And so now she's in a position where she's saying every time the phone rings and it's it's one of our kids or it's one of our relatives or it's a friend, my assumption is bad news. Ooh. And I tense up, even though most of the time it's not. Okay. Okay. So that that's what we want to bring some care into. <laughs> Stacy and I are saying to each other these days, just don't react. <laughs> don't react because we are depleted. It's just the effects of living in an hour like the one we're all living in. And then not a lot in the reserve tank yet. Mm -hmm. Those aren't filling up quickly. Right. They will. They will over time. But, you know, we're highly sensitized now. And so the email that pisses you off or the person on the road or the text that you get. It, right. And I'm reacting to those things. And my reactions aren't typically filled with the spirit <laughs> of God. So we're just coaching each other. We're just saying, honey, just don't react right now. Give it a few minutes before you respond to yes. that text or return that phone call. So That's good. here's what we want to do today, gang, is look at the counsel of Jesus who knows, he gets it. And he knew that we would be living through all this. He actually appointed us to this hour. And what does he have to say? What can we grasp from yes. the heart of our God. And the first thing that comes to my mind is Jesus's counsel that we actually have to take it one day at a time. He says, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And what I love about Jesus, his counsel is always grounded in reality. Yes. He is a thoroughgoing realist, 
right? It's right. not, these aren't little memes. These, these aren't cute little emojis. <laughs> it, you know, the full text of that from Matthew 6 goes like this, beginning in verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They don't labor or spin, and yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. And by the way, I love Jesus's love of nature. Yes. And he goes on to say, if that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? What's coming at me next, mm -hmm. right? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. And then he concludes with, therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And just the loving counsel of it does no good to live into the future. Right. It does no good to anticipate mm. what may be coming. He's like, that's just going to wear you out. Stay in today. Stay in the present moment, one day at a time. But that's so hard. I mean, everything in me, I think in humanity, you're in the moment, but you're spending currency in the moment imagining what could happen, fearing what could happen tomorrow yep. or next week. Yeah. You know, I just find in if I can stay in the day, I'm pretty good when I'm present for what comes. Like if I can do that. It's never quite as bad as I thought, and there's always some way that God comes through and he's present or a friend comes in. But man, when I start trying to either think about yesterday and how I blew it or tomorrow and, well, what if he says this or what if this happens? And then, man, I'm just tanked. Yep. Yep. So I know, gang, I know you're, you're right there with Alan. Like, I can't do that. What do you mean live one day at a time? But Jesus is the one who said it, not me. And if he gave us that as a rescue, then it must be possible with him. He's not setting up a new set of pressures for us. He's trying to get us out of the chaos. So one day at a time, I think it's fascinating that one day at a time is really helpful, very popular in the recovery movements, very popular within mm -hmm. AA and 12-step programs. Because the idea there is you have people coming out of addiction recovery and the thought of I've got to stay sober for the rest of my life is overwhelming. You can't do that. You can't live the rest of your life every day, yeah, right? Yeah. And so the, the beautiful counsel is just today, just stay sober today, one day at a time. All I need to do, all I'm facing right now is I'm not going to turn back to my addictions today, just today. Yes. And it's, it works. It's very helpful to not project out into the future of, oh my gosh, I got to do this. A you thousand know. more. Days. Yeah, a thousand yeah. more. I can't handle that. Right, exactly. But you can handle today. And I think it's fascinating too, Alan, that connected to this, I mean, Matthew 6, just some verses earlier, Jesus teaches us to pray and he says, give us today our daily bread, which of course is connected to the the manna story, yeah. you know, he's he's Jewish. He's speaking to a Jewish audience. They're all going to go, oh, daily bread. Yeah, we get that. We remember that story that we've been told since our childhood. 
the idea that the grace is for today. Give us our daily bread, mm. not our weekly bread, not our monthly bread, not our annual bread supply. <laughs> hey, back up that semi. <laughs> right, I'll take it all Lord, now. Yeah. yeah, and you can just park that thing over there and then I'll know I'm okay <laughs> right. for the year. So I wanted to go back to that story. So the story takes place in the exodus of Israel from Egypt and in their journey to the promised land. And they have just experienced phenomenal engagement, intervention by God. I mean, God literally goes against the major principalities of the world at the time located in Egypt and plague after plague, he is literally specifically taking on these gods, these foul spirits uh, of Egypt that has kept his people in bondage, throws them all down, gets them through the Red Sea, destroys the army, right, mm -hmm. of Egypt. And, and then they set out, and here's how it goes. The whole Israelite community set out from Elim and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There, we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. <laughs> oh man. Human nature. <laughs> and then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So that, obviously, so they don't have to go out on the Sabbath, right? So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, in the evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that you should grumble against us? I <laughs> like that little leadership piece. Like, why are you pinning this on me? Moses also said, you will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. That evening, quail came and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, what is it? What's this stuff? which is what manna means. The word manna means, what's this stuff? Hmm. For they did not know what it was. And Moses said, it is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Each one is to gather as much as he needs. Take an omer for each person you have in your tent. The Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, some little. And when they measured it by the omer, he who had gathered much did not have too much. And he who gathered little did not have too little. Everyone gathered as much as they needed. And then Moses reminds them, no one is to keep any of it until morning. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until the morning, but it was full of maggots and began to smell. Okay, so that's the wow. story, yeah, right, that Jesus right. is clearly referring to in the Lord's Prayer, our daily bread, today's bread. Yeah. And the beauty of that is if we have the stay in today orientation, all I'm asking God for is the measure of grace, mm. the provision of his presence, his help, his counsel, his strength that I need for today. And I don't need to feel like, oh, I've got enough for the next you know, several days or I've got enough for the next year. Right. It's for today. It's such a powerful story. And as you were reading it, I just let it kind of just wash over me anew to try to hear it for the first time. And one of the things I caught in there was so that in the morning, the next morning, they would see the glory 
of the Lord. I mean, when we try to store up enough where we're just good, like we we don't really need anything because we're gonna we're gonna take all we can get for as long as we can, um, which I do all the time, try to in other ways. Like I don't, it's hard to see the glory of God then because you know, you've said many times, John, in other contexts, that the reason that God doesn't give us like all the answers up front is because then we no longer look to him. Like we want the map more than we want God, and instead he gives us himself. Yeah. And we can have him each day. And that story uh, it just to me feels like another way he's showing us grumbling, you know, worrisome sons and daughters of his, like, no, 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 no. Like, I, it just, just, I need to discover how to live that way again. And there's compassion to all this. Christ is saying, don't worry about tomorrow. Don't try and live into the future. Stay in today. The grace is for today. And Alan, I know that you've experienced the reality of that, the helpfulness of taking it one day at a time. Yeah. A while back, but not that long ago, I mean, in the last year or so, we had a traumatic uh, experience with our youngest son. And he basically, out of the blue, one night, we went up to check on him. He was doing homework, and he was having seizure-like symptoms, full body shaking. He was conscious, but it was uncontrollable, and it went on not just for a minute or two, but it went on 10, 15 minutes. And so we called 911, got an ambulance. He went to the hospital. They had to sedate him. Nobody knew what it was, but they released him the next morning when it wasn't happening. And then within hours, it was happening again, and we were back in the ER the second mm-hmm. night. Those seizures didn't happen after those two nights, but the the effect of that, we ended up taking him out of school and and he couldn't do homeschool for a little while so we just were day by day not knowing we don't want to trigger anything that would create the next er visit but the situation at hand nobody quite knew what to do about it and uh, it was an immensely hard time where fear tried to get in worry tried to get in it did get in sometimes for us because Kelly and I would start projecting, you know, oh my gosh, what if he can never go back to school? What if his life is going to be filled with these things that could happen any moment at any time and the doctors aren't sure how to stop it or what to do? It was a super hard time to stay in the day. And a lot of days during those early moments, Chase would say, I can't look at the textbook right now or school book. I don't want to get out and do a lot, but I'll work on a puzzle or I'll I'll do one of those 5,000 Lego piece things where my mind can kind of just not think about the other things. And that's not a sustainable way Mm -hmm. if you go, how many Lego sets are there in the world? Like, you know, but we had to try to stay in the day and John, the best moments where when Kelly and I said, that's enough for right now. Like, what's the next thing we can do to help him in this moment and do that right now? And we don't know what tomorrow or what five months, six months from now will look like if he'll be back in school or if we'll have to homeschool at a slower pace or a different pace. And that ended up being a journey that played out over the course of a year so it wasn't a short-term fix. Things started to change, and, and there was some improvement. But if we had known that on the front end, it would have been too much. Overwhelming. And impossible, I think. And it would have taken all of us out where we needed to be there for him. But when we thankfully were able to go, we have no idea what the future holds. We're going to do the best we can every day to care for his heart and to shepherd him and to try to find answers And if he wakes up and he says, I can't do anything today, okay, okay. That doesn't mean he can't do anything for a week or a month. Yeah, because as a parent, you do go to, is this our life now? 
is this going to be their, oh my gosh, what about college? What about career? And of yes, course, right? right? Again, right. it's human nature to start living into the future. You got to pull back into the present. And Alan, as you're telling that story, what I'm aware of, you weren't merely staying in the day, you were staying in the hour. Mm. We're not even going to plan for this afternoon. Right. We're not going to anticipate what tonight's going to be like. Right. We're just going to stay in right now. Right. There were so many moments where that alone, staying in the moment, felt impossible. Mm. Because I'm a storyteller. I love to imagine you know, what could be and how things will play out. And my mind just races there. And so if he was having a really hard day where he couldn't get outside because his energy was totally drained, I would think, He's going to be in his room the rest of his life. You know, like I would, yeah, I would go there and then that would take me out. And so all we knew was we can't live that way, but we can care for his heart now. What does he need right now? And if he needs something different tomorrow, I guess we'll figure that out tomorrow. But today, in this second, what's the best thing? And maybe it's sitting with him doing a puzzle. Maybe it's just letting him sleep more. Maybe it's, you know, just being there with your hand on his shoulder. So um, it was a way that God showed us, though, I will be there in the moment. And so quit looking back at yesterday and assuming if he had a seizure-like effect yesterday, it's going to happen today. Mm. And quit looking at tomorrow, assuming where he is today is is where it's going to be. And the daily manna concept you're talking about, like, although I didn't see it with that scripture in mind in the moment, that's what we were having to learn was yeah. for right now. I can picture a lot of sticky notes going up on refrigerators and bathroom mirrors that simply say, I can do today. I can do, yeah, I can do right now, which, which is the counsel of Jesus. Don't live into the future. And particularly, the piece of don't anticipate trouble, anticipate good. I think tied to his loving counsel to stay in today, don't live into the future, is also don't anticipate trouble, anticipate good. Because as I'm looking at the world right now, and watching governments and nature and economies and all. Like, you go to Gadzooks, where is this world headed? Right. And then immediately, I am anticipating the future, and the future is not good. Right? Right. Or on a personal level, the way we do that is, I'm not sure how much more I can take. Not only are you living into the future, but you're anticipating bad. Right. You're trying to take the future and take it on today. You can't do that. Literally can't do that. And like you said, and instead of expecting the glory of God in the morning, we're already expecting trauma yes. when we lay our head on the pillow at night. Yes. So this is where we can shepherd our hearts, gang, is to be very careful about the agreements you are making about the future. Oh, man, here it comes again, or whatever form that may take. Even I can't take anymore. I know that feels real, but not to make that agreement to say, Father, you have manna for me today. You have provision for this hour. Yes. I can do the next hour. I was reading a fascinating study on how the Navy SEALs build mental resilience for a project I'm working on. And I was really curious because, wow, you know, they get thrown into the worst of the worst situations. How do they build mental resilience? And this is fascinating, Alan. They set short goals. And one Navy SEAL was quoted as saying, my goal is to make it to lunch. Wow. That's it. That's, wow. that's as far into the future as I'm living. Lunch. Hmm. I can get to lunch. And then from there, you set a new goal. You say, I can make it to 2 p.m. I can make it to 4, you know, 
So interesting. It, well, it's a beautiful yeah. example yeah. of how our psychology is wired and how the human brain and the human soul works of do not live into the future and don't anticipate evil for heaven's sakes. Don't do that to yourself with agreements like, oh boy, here it comes. You know, what's the next thing going to be? I've been reading also for recreational reading. I went back to Stephen Ambrose's book, Undaunted Courage, mm -hmm. which is a story of Lewis and Clark's journey across the American West before it was the American West and their first encounters with native tribes. And no white man had encountered the pronghorn antelope. I mean, on and on it went. It was described as the psychological equivalent of going to the moon for them. I mean, they were beyond wow. all human communication. They were beyond any form of support or help. And the core of discovery, this group of voyagers, they were looking for the water route to the Pacific. And every day, these guys would encounter a whole bunch of new obstacles. They're going upriver in canoes and in this huge keel boat. So they're having to row, push, pull. When it was too hard, they mm. get out on the bank and pull the canoes up with ropes. Oh, this is their daily. Wow. And each day they'd hit some new thing. So the Hidatsa tribe was aware of what was coming on the Missouri was the Great Falls of, of the Missouri. But they said, it's not that big. There's one set of falls and you can get around it in a couple hours. Well, they get there and it's massive. And it goes on for miles. And there's series and series of cascades and falls. And it's a two-week portage to get around it, not a couple-hour thing. So this is their daily. And in his journals, you can see the mental choice. Lewis, is because he, he kept daily journals, he said, I think tomorrow our road will be clear. And he keeps saying something like that. I think we're past the worst. And I think tomorrow our road will be. Now, they start seeing the Rocky Mountains. <laughs> Which no nobody yeah, had seen mountains right. that big in the U.S. at that time, you know, compared to the Alleghenies, the Rockies were like, you know, the, the mountains yeah. of the moon, and yes. and so. But he keeps he keeps this attitude of I'm not going to anticipate bad. I'm going to anticipate good until we hit the next problem, and then we'll handle it when we hit it. So it's just that idea of stay in today. Don't anticipate trouble. Right. Right. Don't make agreements with that. And then finally, I think what we want to offer this week is to ask ourselves, to ask you all, friends, what are the promises that you are holding on to these days? What is it that you are clinging to, to strengthen your heart, to give you hope, to remind you of the truth? What are the promises, Alan, that you're hanging on to these days? Yeah, well, I'll start with just something simple that Kelly and I try to do that is the promise that we can visually see. And you were talking about how Jesus loved nature and being out. And one of the things Kelly and I have discovered is if we can intentionally make time to see the sunrise and the sunset each day, if we can bookend our day with literally experiencing watching the sun come up and then the sun go down. To me, that anchors us in the day really huh. well. You know, it's a visceral way to go, right, I was meant to live fully in this time period that God's given us, not mm. flashbacks and memories of yesterday and last year and tomorrow and next year. So that's one just really cool thing that we try to do a lot. And then uh, a scripture, Deuteronomy 31.8 the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. So do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Like just to, to me, John, that's an anchor of, okay, God is going before me, whatever tomorrow holds, whatever the yep. future has, he's already gone before me there. Mm. He's the Lewis and Clark of, you know, he's blazing the trail. Yes ahead of me and he's with me right now and he's not going to leave me okay so then that makes sense of okay i don't have to be afraid or discouraged i just have to know 
that God is going before me and with me. That reminds me of John 10, where Jesus says, I call my sheep by name, I lead them out, they follow me, and I go before them. And remember years ago reading that and going, wait, what? You go before me? That is not my mental attitude towards the day. <laughs> my mental attitude is, I'm going to connect with you in the morning. I love you very much. Here's the prayer time. And then here I go into the day. Yeah. Right? right? Yes. And the idea of I am going before you. I am going before you. Yeah, for me, the passage in Isaiah 43, verse 2, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. Just the promise of you're not going to be overwhelmed. I am here. You will not be overcome. And I, I know there's a lot of data <laughs> that says, no, I am going to be overwhelmed. I am overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. But there's also, gang, as we've been describing, there's a, there's a lot of spiritual oppression in the world right now that's trying to get us to make agreements with overwhelmed and overcome and desolation and barrenness and forsakenness and you know whatever our personal emotional version of that is. Not living into tomorrow, not anticipating trouble, but clinging to these types of promises. I'm with you, I'm going before you, you're not going to be overwhelmed. And I think as an exercise, gang, as we, as we wind up this week, it would be good to ask yourself and to ask God, what are the agreements I'm currently making about my future? You might be surprised <laughs> yeah. of what's actually down in there that you've already just anticipated, man, it's just whack-a-mole. It's just gonna be one more thing. I'm already, I'm anticipating trouble. You wanna break those agreements. And then find the promises of God that speak to your current situation and cling to them. You gotta have a couple that you're holding on to yeah. in each season of life. Yeah, you do. And I didn't know you were gonna read Isaiah 43 to John before you just read it, but the last one I wanted to share was Isaiah 43, 18 and 19, just a few verses later where it says, forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. And that whole thought of I am doing a new thing and and I just have to let everybody know, like Chase, that story I told earlier, he's doing great. I mean, he has not had another seizure-like symptom or experience. He's fully back in school. He's got a job. He is more his vibrant self than he has ever been a year later. It was a long year, but God is doing a new thing. And, and so when we see that happen, I think it just helps us know and trust, yeah, one day at a time, we can do this with God. Okay. And we may not see it in our own lives, but this is the power of testimony. When you hear it in someone else's life, rather than envying it and judging them, <laughs> let it be a source of encouragement. Oh, she, she got through grad school. She made it. She's doing well. Oh, you know, they, yeah. they made it through infertility and they have a family now and maybe it was through adoption. But you see what I'm saying yes. is you, you can look at other people's breakthrough and rather than envying it, you can draw strength from it and say, that's my God. That's my God. That's Jesus right there. So in the story that Chase has made it through, we're so profoundly grateful. And let that be an encouragement versus not me, I'm still stuck in it. You don't know what we're dealing with our kid. Like that's an agreement. I know the temptation personally to go, yeah, but you don't know my circumstances. That's exactly what we're talking about. Being aware of those agreements, 
taking it a day at a time, looking for the daily bread. What is your daily provision for me today? God, I just need today. Not living into the past right. with regret, not living into the future with anticipation, particularly anticipation of bad things or fear. Jesus said, you can't, you can't even add a single hour to your life by doing that. It doesn't do any good. And, and we're all sensitized right now. We are very, we have hair triggers to this kind of stuff because of the effects of trauma and, and how it sensitizes us to the next round. And thus the loving counsel of Jesus, like this is so kind. Take it one day at a time. Look for the manna that's being given for this moment. Take it an hour at a time if you have to. Be careful of the agreements that want to get in. It's so natural. And, and then find the promises that you are clinging to, that God is coming for you and for your situation. 